Good evening, everybody. My name is Mark Baltzell. I'm the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife's Statewide Salmon and Steelhead Manager. We're here tonight for our first uh, public meeting in regards to Puget Sound recreational fisheries uh, and uh, coastal and hood canal recreational fisheries. <clears throat> Got a team of folks here tonight. I'm gonna talk for a little bit while we get more participants joining. Uh, if you're uh, tonight on the Zoom meeting, uh, if you're talking, we'd ask that you turn your camera on uh, when you're talking and please mute and unmute yourself through the control, control panel at the bottom of your screen. We're gonna keep folks muted. Um, we'll open up uh, for questions and feedback during the meeting. If you're on a phone, you can unmute yourself by pressing star six. We would ask that folks raise their hand to ask a question. This can be accessed through the bottom of your control panel, uh, either by hover, uh, hovering over the, there's a, uh, an emotion face at the bottom of the screen, um, or if you're on the phone, you can also hit star nine. Tonight during our meeting, we ask that you be respectful of each other, uh, we ask that you uh, be tough on the issues, but not on people. Please refrain from personal attacks. Uh, we're going to go through lots of information tonight, so uh, put your listening ears on. And we're going to try to uh, allow for a balance of speaking time. We're going to try to, staff's going to try to get through the presentation here in a good amount of time to leave plenty of time for questions and feedback. A reminder to everybody that this meeting is being recorded and will be available on our website uh, in the future for folks who couldn't make it tonight. Next slide, please. So as I said, this is the Puget Sound and Coastal Freshwater Recreational Discussion. Next slide. So uh, tonight, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through uh, a forecast review we're going to look at coastal forecasts, trends, and opportunities. We're going to go through the management objectives this year for Chinook and Coho in Puget Sound. We're going to go through some of the modeling that's happened between the PFMC meeting and the co-manager meeting last week. We're going to talk about some of the considerations for recreational seasons this year. And then the main focus of our meeting tonight is to take public comment. Next slide. So for those folks who are new to the process, North of Falcon is an annual cooperative process to plan salmon seasons in Washington waters. That cooperation is between state governments of California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho. Uh, also through the Pacific Salmon Treaty, there are harvest limits set. The name North of Falcon refers to the waters off Oregon's Cape Falcon which marks the southern border of the management of Washington salmon stocks. And as I indicated, it's one small component in a larger salmon setting process that involves our tribes, federal regulators, as I said, other states, as well as Canada. North of Falcon is also part of the way that we uh, develop and, and uh, enable rules that guide our salmon seasons each year. Back in January, we filed a CR 101, which starts the rulemaking process in any given salmon year. Right now, we're in this uh, middle stage between the CR 101 and the CR 102. This is where we develop uh, salmon seasons with all our partners and the public, and then that ends uh, in the early parts of April. After we have a tentative agreement on seasons, we do a CR 102 filing. We take written comments and hold a public hearing on those proposed rules. From that, we consider any proposed modifications to seasons. From there, we respond to those in a concise explanatory statement and file a CR 103, which eff effectively uh, are the final rules for this upcoming season. Uh, the director signs them, and then 31 days after the director signs those rules and they are filed is when our seasons start. With that, I am going to turn the microphone over to Kirsten Simonson, Dr. Kirsten Simonson, who's our head recreational fishery manager for Puget Sound Salmon Fisheries. 
Thanks, Mark. Uh, so I'm just going to go through a quick forecast recap for this year, uh, focusing on Chinook and coho forecasts around the state. <clears throat> so Puget Sound Chinook, the natural stocks are down 29% and the hatchery stocks are up 34% from the most recent 10-year average. Uh, coastal Chinook stocks, uh, the natural stocks are up 8% and the hatchery stocks are up 7% from the recent 10-year average. But both of those stocks are slightly down from the 2022 forecast. <clears throat> down in Columbia River, uh, the forecast for spring and summer Chinook increased relative to 2022 forecasts and actual returns. The lower river hatchery and upriver up bright stock slightly improved relative to last year's forecast, and the Bonneville pool hatchery forecast are significantly higher than last year's forecast. For coho stocks, for Puget Sound coho, the natural stocks are up 6% and the hatchery stocks are up 50% from the 10-year average. Coastal coho natural stocks are up 53% and hatchery stocks are up 100% from the 10-year average. Natural stocks are up 2% and hatchery stocks are up 30% relative to 2022 forecasts. In Columbia River, uh, there are strong forecasts for coho for 2023, um, a little over 809,000, which is down slightly from the 2022 forecast of 876,000. For Puget Sound Pink, the pink forecast is up about 1% from the most recent 10 year average. The 2023 Puget Sound total is forecast to be just shy of 4 million. <clears throat> for Puget Sound Chum, the natural stocks are down 40% and the hatchery stocks are down 56% from the 10 year average. The Puget Sound Fall Chum total is about 651,000. And for coastal chum, Willapa are down 8% and Grace Harbor are up 21% from the 10-year average. For sockeye, uh, Baker Lake sockeye, the forecast is near the 10-year average about, of about 31,000. For Lake Washington, the forecast is down 65% from the 10-year average and that's about 22,000 forecasted to return. And for Columbia River sockeye, the Wenatchee is down about 35% from the 10-year average. The Okanagan is down 23% from the 10 year average, and the total Columbia River forecast is about 235,000. For looking at some of the North Coast uh, forecasts, if we look at first the Ho area forecasts, um, the wild fall Chinook are down slightly from this year as compared to 2022. You'll see it's about 23% lower than last year. Wild spring Chinook are, however, up about 50% from last year and wild fall coho are uh, up about 40% from last year. <clears throat> Moving down to the Quileute, the hatchery spring are about on par with what they were last year. The forecast is roughly the same. Wild fall Chinook are up about 29% last year and wild summer Chinook are up, uh, Chinook are up about 20% from last year. For coho, the hatchery summers are down about 15% from last year. Wild summer coho are up quite a bit from last year, up about 80%. Uh, hatchery fall coho are about on par with what the forecast was from last year, and wild fall coho are also about on par with what the forecast was last year. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Derek Dapp, who can run us through some of the Chinook management objectives for Puget Sound. Thank you, Kirsten. And as we're starting to look at this management objectives table, uh, for folks who might be new to the process or who might not have been through this before, there are a number of different metrics that we look at to assess our management objectives, and they're defined under different metrics. Um, starting with, uh, you might see um, these acronyms on the screen, uh, ER. Um, so ER stands for an exploitation rate. That is the percentage of adult um, fish being removed um, either from a fishery or a suite of fisheries. And there's different ER metrics that we look at um, depending on the stock uh, management unit. So uh, for example, on screen now, you might see uh, where it says uh, total rate, for example, for Skagit Springs, um, that would be a total exploitation rate metric. So that would be looking at the, ex um, that would be looking at the percent removals of adult Chinook uh, for all fisheries um, from Alaska all the way down to California. We have some stocks that are designated as having a Southern US or an SUS exploitation rate metric. Um, for example, Nooksack Springs, and that metric would be looking at uh, basically any fisheries that are south of West Coast Vancouver Island, including those in Washington, Oregon, and California. In some cases, you see that there's a metric of a PTSUS, and what that stands for is a pre-terminal southern US, and uh, that, would that, that would consist of fisheries south of West Coast Vancouver Island, but 
outside of the rivers of origin for each of these stocks. So um, now looking at some of the Chinook stocks um, that might uh, that might drive some of our uh, fisheries and management this year. Um, starting off with the one that's highlighted in orange, Stillaguamish. Um, Stillaguamish has been kind of one of the primary constraining Chinook stocks uh, in Puget Sound over the last few years, and we anticipate that it would continue to be so in this year. In now the stocks that are highlighted in kind of a gray color, um, maybe I'll start off with uh, Nisqually. Uh, Nisqually is a stock that's come up over the past few years as being potentially constraining. Uh, this year, um, we do have a hatchery forecast for Nisqually that's down by about 5,000 fish from what it was last year. And we are concerned that it might fall below its low abundance threshold. So that's one to be monitoring. Um, similarly, Skagit Summer Falls um, is currently below its low abundance threshold, and that necessitates a 17% southern U.S. exploitation rate limit. Um, three other stocks that have come up in recent years and have helped to kind of shape the fisheries uh, in the preseason, Nooksack Springs, Snohomish, and Skokomish Falls. Um, you can see their management objectives on screen here, but those would be three other stocks we'll be paying attention to. Um, now I'll hand the mic over to Angelica, and she'll walk us through um, coho management objectives. Good evening. Uh, my name is Angelika hagen bro and I'm talking about Coho. And as you have heard from the forecast, uh, Coho this year are actually a pretty uh, positive story. And uh, as far as the management objectives go, uh, it's, it's the objectives similar to what you saw for Chinook. Some of these are total exploitation rates. Uh, others are just looking at management objectives that pertain to southern U.S. And then we also have a few stocks that are actually managed for an escapement goal. But starting with the Strait of Juan de Fuca, we have a 40% total ER. That stock is doing pretty well this year, even though it says it's in low status. It was critical last year, and we were managing for 20%. So 40% uh, is uh, definitely uh, a lot uh, more exploitation for that stock than we experienced in the past. For Hood Canal, uh, same as last year, we're at 45 percent. Skagit, uh, unfortunately, that's the one stock uh, that came in lower than last year. And because uh, of its low abundance, it actually went from um, a normal uh, status to a low status. And if Skagit is in normal status, it has a 60% ceiling. And this year, uh, the ceiling dropped to just 35%. And in the model runs that we have just recently completed that have almost everything updated, we have all the forecasts in the runs, we have most of the fisheries in, um, with the exception of some coastal fisheries, Skagit was, um, I think, approximately around 38%. So still above, but definitely a lot better than it looked initially when we did last year's fisheries this year's abundance run. So the new fisheries that went into the model run already decreased the exploitation rate. So within, we're within uh, just a few percentage point of the management objective. Still Guamish is in normal status, same as last year. Uh, Still Guamish is looking good. Snohomish is also in low status with a 40% ER ceiling. And we're below that ceiling, but uh, there's also uh, an escapement goal for that stock which is 50,000 and in the high ocean option that has the biggest ocean fisheries, uh, the escapement is a little bit above 49,000. So there, we have a, a little ways to go, uh, not much, uh, very doable, I believe, but uh, we're not quite there on Snohomish. Thompson has been in low status for many, many years, and that's our uh, British Columbia interior Fraser stock. We, we are on the southern U.S. management objective of 10 percent, and in the high ocean option, we're exactly at 10 percent. So depending on how fisheries are being shaped, uh, there's definitely uh, the potential to go over on this stock. Uh, that's it for this slide. It looks like um, it's um, Derek is probably going to talk about the Chinook piece and I can talk about, or since I'm on, I'll just going to talk about the coastal <laughs> so we don't have to switch back and forth so much. As far as coastal coho go, the forecasts, if you recall, they're actually pretty good, quite good actually. And all the coastal coho stocks uh, exceed their escapement goal by a comfortable margin, which is super encouraging because in past years that has not always been the case. 
that's it. Any questions about that or just move on to Derek? Thanks, Angelica. And so I won't go into too much depth on uh, the Chinook objectives for the coast here. We do have Quill and Ho uh, up on screen now. Um, and uh, if there's any questions, we can get to that kind of in some of the later sections, but maybe moving on to the next slide, Kirsten. So as Angelica mentioned, um, uh, kind of in our last public meeting last week, um, we had um, uh, taken a look at the modeling in some more depth. Um, I, I do recognize kind of on the attendees, there's a lot of familiar faces who are also in that meeting. Um, in that initial set of model runs that we had uh, coming out of the Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting, we were looking at um, uh, a suite of model runs that had um, last year's fisheries uh, for Puget Sound in the model. And, um, and in addition to that, that was coupled with updated ocean fisheries representing some options for 2023. Um, and all the other updates where we had them, we are still missing a few updates for Canadian fisheries, um, particularly for West Coast Vancouver Island uh, troll and sport, as well as for Northern British Columbia troll and sport and Southeast Alaska uh, troll sport and net. Um, but um, since that meeting, um, in that meeting, we had identified that there was um, kind of a, a few stocks that we're really going to be paying attention to from the Chinook side of things, um, starting off with Stiligwamish, that has been, once again, kind of one of the, the stocks that's primarily helped to shape our marine fishery package as we um, go into the preseason process. But we'd also identified that there were five other stocks that um, we thought could potentially uh, shape our management in 2023. Those were Nooksack Springs, Skagit Summer Falls, uh, Skykomish Summer Falls, Nisqually and Skokomish. So um, maybe if we could move to the next slide. So um, folks might remember from uh, that meeting last week that we had presented kind of uh, a number of potential modeling scenarios. Um, you might notice that on screen now, there's a little bit different number than we'd presented um, kind of in that meeting. Uh, in that meeting, I think we were looking at potentially working with um, 11 Stiligwamish mortalities after we kind of updated some changes to the COHO modeling that'll be discussed shortly, um, as well as um, as well as did a few other updates, such as um, updating um, Marine Area 7 to be uh, last year's preseason modeled effort and uh, Marine Area 9 as well. That left us with seven Stiligwamish AEQ mortalities to work with. And so uh, with those mortalities that we had to work with potentially, um, we looked at two different scenarios. We had a scenario one, which was potentially adding additional quota to marine areas that had been most restricted in recent years. And particularly we highlighted marine areas seven and nine. And then we had a second scenario, which was to use the available impacts to uh, bolster marine areas that have a rel relatively low impact on Stiligwamish. And the idea in the second one is that you could potentially maximize your catch and time on the water um, for the Stiligwamish impacts that we had available. So um, after hearing feedback from the public, if we move to the next slide, we've now performed kind of our first set of model runs with Puget Sound Fisheries in them. And uh, once again, with that starting model of uh, having 93 Stiligwamish AEQs in it with a goal of 100 Stiligwamish AEQs, um, this is kind of the list of, of changes that we made. Uh, first of all, we started with keeping the same seasons and effort as in 2022 um, across the board. That was kind of the baseline. Um, and then um, we, um, we kind of heard in our last public meeting that there was an interest in better aligning some of our winter seasons, particularly in marine areas uh, 10 and 11. So uh, we changed the modeling of Marine Area 11 from that November, December period to uh, February, March to match up with Area 10. Um, beyond that, we then updated the Area 10 summer quota um, using the catch per day method, which um, you can see what the quota change was here from about 4,000 fish to about 5,200. Um, and the cost of that was approximately two Stiligwamish AEQs. Also in line with kind of that scenario too, was we updated Marine Area 6 in the summer using the catch per day method. It changes the quota from around 6,300 to around uh, almost 9,000 fish, a, a very healthy quota. Um, and that approximately costs two Stiligwamish AEQs. More in line with scenario one, actually, we, um, we added um, one Stiligwamish AEQ that we had um, into Marine Area 7 summer. Um, and it was a small increase of quota, but once again, Marine Area 7 summer is uh, one of the ones that has been hit really hard over the past few years. So even a small increase in quota might be some benefit there. 
we had um, two Stillaguamish AEQs remaining, and we used those to bolster Marine Area 11, um, both um, in the June period and also in the July to September period. Folks might notice that we did bolster that June quota by about 800 fish. Um, and the logic there was that they had a really short season last year. Um, they were modeled uh, during that June period being open the whole month and they closed after, um, they closed after just three days. So um, I think that's kind of uh, where we landed on the Chinook modeling. And if we move to the next slide, maybe I'll turn it over to Kirsten to talk about the proposed Chinook seasons. Thanks, Derek. So right now you can see kind of the uh, the matrix that we create every year to look at kind of initial proposals. So this is the first look at proposed seasons for this year. Uh, so there's some things that are probably not going to be a big surprise or change from last year. So you can see area five kind of is really similar to what it was last year with a July one opener uh, for Chinook running through mid-August and at which point it'll switch over to non-retention during the coho season. Um, and you'll see there is a mark selective fishery again in that wintertime per period from uh, March, beginning of March to end of April. Um, area six is also really similar to what it was last year uh, with the July one opener through mid-August as well. And again, that non-retention time period added in for coho. <clears throat> for area seven, um, you'll see that this uh, is a mark selective fishery for mid-July. We are planning for um, Area 7 to be really similar to what we did last year, where we're going to start with three-day openers um, on the weekends, beginning July 13th, and that'll again be Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then we will continue to um, open that after in-season management um, determines that there's enough available quota to do so. Uh, so you'll remember the last year we had one weekend that was planned, and we ended up with three weekends, um, so we are hopeful that if we continue the same plan with in-season management and a uh, larger quota this year as compared to last year that we'll be able to get the same kind of uh, extended season that we had uh, last year from the original proposal. Um, you'll then see there's some non-retention time built in from mid-August uh, through mid-September for the coho seasons, which I will talk about next. Um, 8.1 and 8.2 are going to be coho and pink only this year, so no Chinook retention in 8.1 or 8.2. Um, area nine is going to be really similar to what it was last year as well, uh, with those three day openers um, beginning in mid July again. So July 13th opener for three days, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday again through the end of July, at which point we will um, open it up for seven days a week beginning, um, I believe, the 31st of July through mid August or until the quota um, is extend is um, gotten through. Um, area 10, uh, we are looking for a June 1 opener for co-hosts, there you see that non-retention um, piece added in for early part of June. And then again, the July time period will start on the 13th as, to coincide with um, area seven and nine. You'll see that the area 10 winter fishery is ex again modeled for February 1 through the end of March. And we are also adding uh, the area 11 fishery to be that February through March time period. Um, I know that this year, the Area 10 blackmouth fishery was not able to be opened into March, and we're hoping that by having Area 11 um, be open at the same time, that we'll be able to spread out effort and have those seasons kind of coinciding and therefore able to remain open for that time period. <clears throat> uh, moving into Area 11, you'll see that that's again a June 1 start. Um, Derek just mentioned that there will be two different modeling pieces with that again, the June time period, which will have its own quota, and then the July time period. Um, and again, that's kind of planned really similar to what the way it was last year. And then you'll see um, area 12, uh, you'll see the south of AOC part where July 1 opener for Mark Selective Fisheries, and of course area 13 will be the same as it was last year. So just to kind of highlight some of the differences and some of the changes from last year, um, areas 5 and 6, no changes. Um, area 7, again, it's going to be that July 13th start with three-day openers, um, and then we will open as we can with in-season management. Um, area nine, um, again, the July 13th start with three-day openers, um, and then it'll open seven days beginning the 31st. Um, Alex, I do see here that your hand is raised, but we're going to hold questions to the end of the presentation. Um, for area 10, again, that June 13th or July 13th start, um, and then again, the February through, uh, through March uh, Black Mouth season in the winter. Area 11, a June 1 start uh, with that February through March Black Mouth winter season. So that it coincides with area 10 and areas 12 and 13, you'll see no changes. So moving to coho, 
This is these are the original are the initial proposed seasons for coho. Um, area five and six again you'll see um, there's a, a slight change here and that has to do with adding the addition of some non selective time at the end of September, and I will talk about that in more detail in a minute. Um, area seven <laughs> you'll see that we um, we're trying to add some non selective time for area seven as well, um, you can see that the times are different so that is going to start with those three day openers again in on July 13th. And then it will open up again um, in August for uh, non selective fishing through the through mid September. <clears throat> um, eight one and eight two you'll see that it, uh, we're scheduling it to be open right now. August 1 through the end of September for both 8.1 and 8.2 for non-selective coho fishing. Area 9, again, is going to be marked selective to start the season. Um, and you'll see it again starts with that July 13th three-day opener. And then it will open up kind of more consistently after those three-day openers are um, finished up at the end of July um, through August. And you'll see we also added some non-selective coho fishing time at the end of September and into mid-October in Area 9. Um, areas 10 and 11, you'll see there is non-selective fishing starting uh, June 1, going through the end of October, and then again that, that winter time period from February 1 through um, March 31. Um, you can see area 12 uh, will have some uh, non-selective coho fishing beginning mid-July uh, north of AOC, and then July 1 south of AOC, and again area 13, um, that marks selective fishery that will be open year-round. So getting into some more detail about some of these changes. Um, so again, area five and six will be marked selective through the 22nd. Um, and then, or I believe that's it's through the end of the of the month, but there will be non-selective days on the weekends. This is a little bit confusing and I had some trouble trying to keep it straight too. So I'm gonna try to walk through it and, and somebody will correct me if I'm wrong. So it's gonna be marked selective basically for the entire uh, time period to the end of September. However, those last two weekends in September, the 23rd and 24th and 29th and 30th will be non-selective. So it'll be four weekend days that will be non-selective for coho in areas five and six. During the week, it will stay marked selective and then on the weekends, non-selective for those last two weeks of September. Uh, for area seven, it'll be non-selective, but there will be a one coho limit. And that again is July 13th start with those three day openers until uh, the Chinook quota runs out and then uh, it'll be open up for coho again through the 17th of September. Areas 8-1 and 8-2, um, again, it'll be an August 1 opener through the end of September and, the, and uh, in 8-2 it'll be a one coho limit. In area nine, uh, again, it'll be Mark Selective to start out with that July 13th opener for those, those three-day openers, uh, the beginning, beginning part of the season. And then it'll be um, from the 31st through, this, through September 17th, it'll be non-selective, but there will be a one coho limit. And that, uh, or sorry, it'll be, let me start that one over again. Area nine will be Mark Selective from that those three-day openers beginning uh, July 13th. And then it'll be marked selective from the 31st of July through uh, September 17th, and then non-selective from the 18th through the uh, early part of October with a one coho limit when it is non-selective. Um, area 10 and 11, um, no big changes there, but it will be uh, non-selective for that uh, the, from uh, June 1 through the end of uh, the summer, and then the February 1 through March 31 time period. Um, and then area 12, uh, north of AOC will be that uh, July 10th start. And then th area 13, no changes. So now I'm going to turn it over to Mark Dowden to kind of run through some of the uh, information for Hood Canal. Thanks, Kirsten. Mark Downen, District Fish Biologist for Hood Canal. Good evening, everybody. And I'm just going to start with uh, a quick recap of the 2022 freshwater regulations for salmon in Hood Canal. I'm going to start at the bottom of this table and work my way up. Um, we had a couple of closures that we've uh, had to observe in the last five years, um, one being the Duato River where summer chum impacts have been a serious concern. And we've been in a rebuilding status for ESA listed summer chum in the lower Duato River. The second is the Tuhuya River where private property issues and access associated with that um, led to the need to close the Tuhuya coho fishery. The Skokomish fishery, as many of you know, has been closed for a number of years now due to a longstanding reservation boundary dispute. And we could go into that in more detail at the end of the meeting during the question session if folks would like to do that. The Dosi Wallops and Duckabush are going to be um, the same as they were last year as well. Um, 
from 11 1 to 12 15 we've got a fall chum um, freshwater fishery daily limit of two the quill river um, in 2022 and for a number of years prior has had an 816 to 1031 season for coho with a bag limit of four, an anti-snagging rule um, and night closer. However, um, we've had longstanding issues um, with the quill seam fishery. Um, basically there's a, a, a conflict um, ongoing at the Roger Street access with uh, unruliness and, and snagging and um, difficulty in enforcing that. And so I'm gonna talk more about a, some of the issues associated with the quill seam fishery and uh, a proposal that the state is considering for addressing that. Next slide, please. And next slide. So going into more a little bit more detail on the, um, the issues associated with the quill seam coho fishery, um, it, we have an in common fishing area in the lower quill scene with tribal subsistence fishers. Um, and there is a large congregation of tribal subsistence fishers and state fishers down at, at the Roger Street access, um, which is a, a county park about eight tenths of a mile upstream of the mouth. And, and it creates a bottleneck where rampant snagging occurs. And this rampant snagging has been a continuous enforcement challenge and has really only gotten worse um, in, in the last several years. And we've considered solutions in the last couple of years. Um, one is to move our closure boundary upstream above a concrete bulkhead above Roger Street. But that really just moves the snagging problem 100 yards upstream um, rather than reducing it. And it increases the potential for human waste and trash because it pushes people farther away from the facilities there at the Roger Street access. Um, and it increases traffic on summer chum rides. The other option is just an outright closure, um, but that would eliminate all recreational opportunity and be punitive on rule biting anglers. And we certainly don't want that. Next slide. So table one here is the, um, 2022 and, and, and prior um, regulations um, that I previously described. And our proposal for 2023 that we're considering is to basically extend access um, geographically from the mouth all the way to the 101 bridge from August 16th to August 31st, seven days a week. Um, we'd still have the night closure and the anti-snagging rule. Um, the limits would be the same for coho. And then on September 1st, we would basically move our closure not to Roger Street, but upstream of Roger Street to a point known as Collute Bluff, which is basically at the bottom of the WDFW access easement. Next slide, please. And I have a map here. Um, and the far left point um, at, at, at the left edge of the blue line would be the 101 bridge on Highway 101, and the mouth would be the far right, and the orange would be the open area from August 16th through August 31st, um, inclusive of the, both the blue and the orange area, and then after September 1st, um, only the blue section would be open. Next slide. So this would provide an expanded early season um, below Roger Street, which is normally closed um, even on August 15th. And it would remove overlap with the tribal subsistence fishery at Roger Street while preserving sport fishing opportunity along the WDFW access, which is accessed via um, the 101 bridge WDFW uh, access area. Um, it would also reduce traffic fishing and corresponding impacts to summer chum throughout the primary spawning distribution of that stock in the river. And I think that pretty much wraps up what I have for Hood Canal. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate that. So uh, just to get back into some considerations, more considerations for this year. Um, uh, as we know, Silvamish Chinook conservation limits will continue to drive most of the recreational opportunities that we're seeing. 
Um, we are working to balance maximizing fishing opportunity with the available impacts and our conservation constraints. That's always something that goes into the season plannings. Um, we have been looking at recent year variability and effort trends, um, and we have seen increases in effort over historical averages in these recent years. Um, and for the most part, pinks will be part of the daily limit in most areas. We are looking at some areas where we could potentially have an increase in pink, lim in pink limits, uh, but that'll be kind of some localized areas that we're still trying to work out all the details. Uh, for freshwater fishery considerations, most rivers are expected to have similar opportunities to 2022. Uh, pink salmon limits will be watershed specific. Uh, the quill scene, um, there'll be time and area changes in, to avoid gear conflicts, as we just discussed. Um, and in the Samish, there's going to be possible gear changes um, for some of the unruly fishery action that's happened there as well. Um, and with that, I am going to turn it over to Jenny Whitney, who's going to walk us through some more freshwater considerations on the North Coast. Hi, we've received several um, suggestions from the public on uh, for the coastal freshwater regulations. Um, one of the things we heard last year as well was to prioritize time on the water over a larger bag limit. Um, if it's possible to restore the bag limits to what they were formerly on the Ho River. Um, bait is important in the spring Chinook fishery on the Solduck and um, when game fish seasons are open, allow retention of hatchery fish as well. Next slide. Um, the Ho River uh, overall uh, forecasts are looking good this year for the spring fisheries. The wild uh, spring summer Chinook forecast is above the escapement goal of 900, um, but not by enough to probably have a targeted fishery on spring summer Chinook and or the dip in Chinook that come into the Ho River. Uh, for the fall fishery, um, there's increased coho abundance this year, and that should create the potential for an increased bag limit um, back up to two fish, no more than one Chinook on the hoe in the fall. Uh, next slide. Uh, in the Quileute system, um, our forecasts for the hatchery stocks of both spring Chinook and summer coho are a bit lower than they were last year, um, but they're still fairly abundant. And the good news is that both wild summer Chinook and wild summer coho forecasts are up and above the escapement goals. And those are both stocks that have been limiting in recent years on seasons. And we don't foresee that them restricting seasons in 2023. Um, then for the fall fisheries in the Quileute, um, forecasts of both the wild and the hatchery coho are pretty similar to what they were last year, and the wild fall Chinook are up a bit. So I think there's a potential to increase the bag limit on the Bogusheel, Klawa, and Dickey back up to two adults um, after September 15th. Last year it was uh, last year it was down to one. Um, a couple things I think for consideration for anglers is that last year we allowed the retention of salmon through December 15th. And uh, I guess I was curious if there's any Ho or Quileute anglers, if that's something that was utilized and appreciated. Um, and I think that's pretty much it for the North Coast River summary. Thanks, Jenny. So just looking at some upcoming meetings that are happening. Um, so to, uh, tomorrow there's a Willapa Bay fisheries discussion beginning at 6 p.m. also on Zoom. Uh, tomorrow there's also an in-person and hybrid uh, Zoom Columbia River meeting uh, that's taking place in, in Ridgefield, Washington. Uh, the 22nd, there's a Grace Harbor fishery discussion that's gonna be happening on Zoom at 6 p.m. also. March 23rd, there'll be another Puget Sound and, and Freshwater Recreational Fisheries discussion also on Zoom at 6 p.m. On the 29th, next week is North of Falcon number two. That will be a hybrid meeting as well, uh, taking place in Linwood, Washington, and also on Zoom. Uh, there's also on the 29th, there's an Upper Columbia River and Snake River Fisheries discussion in person in Kennewick at 6 p.m. On the 30th is the joint Willapa Bay Grace Harbor Fisheries discussion via Zoom at 6 p.m. And then this will all be wrapping up 
uh, the first week of April with PFMC number two taking place in Foster City, California. There will be uh, daily briefings beginning that Monday the 3rd uh, at 9 a.m. So those will be via Zoom uh, to kind of update on everything that's happening. Um, and all of this information is available on the website um, under the North of Falcon page. There's links to all of these Zoom links or Zoom uh, meetings to register um, and more information can be found there. Um, the public comment portal is also open. That is also available via our, our website as well. And with that, that concludes the presentation portion of the meeting for today. And we will go ahead and open it up to questions. It looks like our first hand is from Martin. Martin, go ahead. I had a question about Area 7 uh, Chinook impacts. Are they going to, if we exceed impacts again, will it affect our coho fisheries? Do you want to take this, Kirsten, or do you want me to give it a try? You can go ahead and give it a try if you want to. So uh, I, I think what we've tried to do is uh, learn from what happened in, uh, several years ago when, when things got shut down. That's why last year uh, we worked with the public to, to come up with these three-day openers to, to try to make sure that we're, we're, we're kind of slowing down the effort and, and ensuring that we're staying within our conservation impacts. Kirsten also talked at the beginning of the meeting about us seeing pretty big shifts in effort over the recent past. I think that's one of the suggestions we took last year and we're looking to implement this year is to align areas seven and nine as well uh, to try to spread out some of that impact as we start the season. Um, you know, these are the first proposed seasons for this year. I think, you know, we're we're looking to get feedback on, on these initial proposals, and this is what we're working on over the next uh, several weeks till we get to the last Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting where we, we still have opportunities here to, to do some fishery shaping and, and um, work with you and take suggestions for, for different ideas if you have them. Excellent. Thank you. So I saw a question in the chat regarding area 12 uh, black mouse seasons. So uh, in the most recent uh, Chinook management plan that's under review by NOAA right now, uh, what we agreed to was that the co-managers wouldn't uh, add any or change any fisheries from the most recent several years uh, while NOAA evaluated uh, our proposal on the Midhood Canal Chinook stock. Um, and so until NOAA gives us back a decision on uh, how they want to manage that with us into the future, uh, we've made a, an agreement to not add any uh, fishing opportunity in that area uh, that's different from the last couple of years that we've been managing. Okay, so I see a hand from Alex Van Hine. Um, Alex, you should be allowed to um, unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. Well, I have a couple. I'll try to get them all in right now. Um, so we're gonna do the Thursday through Saturday. I, I, as I've spoken to you guys about, I think that's a great idea. Uh, my question is, so I think last year we saw multiple or I think two openers for area nine scheduled. Are you gonna proceed with only one scheduled opener for area seven and then go from there? Or are you gonna have two scheduled and go from there? Go ahead, I, I believe that there's multiple but I'm gonna let Mark jump in if I'm wrong on that one. <laughs> well, Alex, actually I think that's one that we would probably work with uh, the public on. I think it's a lot of it's going to depend on the quota available and how comfortable we are thinking, you know, how, how far we think that quota is going to get us looking at what happened last year, you know, trying to project what happens this year. 
um, it's it's never going to be the same. But I think we definitely, uh, you know, consider multiple proposals. I, I think oh. part of the the reluctance to publish multiple uh, weekends was just, uh, you know. Well, I remember the reluctancy. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah. you you guys were pretty fearful we wouldn't even make it through the first weekend. So, right. but with Area Nine, I know Area Nine does carry a larger quota, but you did schedule two for Area Nine. We did see three successful fishing weekends, and I be believe we actually even fell under a hundred percent in Area Seven through the three weekends. So, I'm just curious on why we wouldn't you know, have some form of confidence to at least schedule two and see where it goes from there. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, again, I think it's all about um, um, kind of expectation management. Uh, sure. That, that, that if you publish two weekends, I think people are expecting yeah. two weekends. And um, again, I so a great, great comment. I mean, you know, we'll take that into consideration and I'm certainly uh, I'm certain we'll likely talk about it as we go forward and get closer to a finalized season. Yeah, I totally understand the hesitancy to do it. No one, I mean, you, you would like to avoid uh, having something published than having to close early. I just, that, I think that was something that we could worth, worth discussing with the, an increased quota versus last year. Um, so moving on, when we open that fishery in Area 7 and on July 13th, it, will it be coho retention only on those three-day openers? What area was that? Area seven. So coho retention only in July? No, no, no. So, okay, the fishery in area seven will open July 13th. Yep. And coho will be included in that bag limit. Correct. So then, co so then fishing will close all entirely on after that three day opener, even for coho as well. So right. my question is, fishing is only open in Area 7 during the three-day openers until the coho uh, non-selective fishery occurs? August 1. Okay. So there won't, and so we, we won't see a closure in Area 7 that will be a, it, between uh, the end of Chinook and the beginning of coho? I would say yes. If we run out of Chinook quota, we won't open again until August 1st. Okay, understood. So then getting into coho, uh, you know, last year, the Resurrection Derby put on a coho derby, uh, August 19th and 20th. Uh, I participated in that derby, I think we had over 90 tickets around 90 tickets sold. But I also remember that it was incredibly hard fishing and for uh, yourself, probably as well as other people on this call, we know that those coho generally don't arrive in any kind of substantial number until you know, the early parts of September and then really the season kicks off mid September forward or later. So I would wonder if we would consider and maybe anybody else on this call can say if they have an opinion on this, but if we would consider an actual coho season just being strictly in the month of September 1st through 30th, and we could also even potentially look at uh, increasing that bag limit to two. Um, but I think we would get a lot more production out of that fishery if we saw it uh, be the month of September. So just so we're clear, the proposed season uh, starting August 1 through September 17th is two salmon, one coho. So you right, can get that... two pinks or a pink and a coho. Okay, yeah, I understand that. So, the, and, the, and that's not going to change? We, we are not going to address the potential for that being a, a two fish bag bag limit of any combination of coho or pinks. So I'm gonna guess I'm not sure I'm uh, I'm understanding your question. The the proposal on the table right now is is two salmon, one you know one coho. Right. Is there not the potential of considering changing that fishery to oh, a, any combination? I, I, so I would say. Uh, the likelihood of us offering two coho as a daily limit, unmarked coho, is likely not going to happen because we're already up on our impacts for Thompson in the most recent modeling. So what I'm actually thinking about, Alex, and I'd love to hear your feedback on it, is can we switch things around that gets us fishing later into September uh, non-selectively, like maybe having Mark selective in August and then maybe fishing non-selectively in September. 
yes. just to be able to extend the season out a little bit from the 17th. Yes, I think we're going to have pretty slim production in August on coho. And I think our, our chances of getting quality fish are going to be higher in September. So if we could look at a scenario that, yeah, if it saves us impacts to go mark selective in, in August, and then that allows us to go the full month or at least, you know, I would like to see the full month of September as non-selective. Yep. That, that would be great. Yes. Yeah. We're, we're actually uh, the modelers, uh, Angelica and Ty uh, and Kirsten and I have been, talking a lot about the, the coho modeling since we did it last week with the co-managers. Um, we're digging into some of those inputs and, and looking at some of the distributions of impacts. And so uh, we are considering a number of different scenarios that are, uh, that are trying to get us later into September with that area seven fishery. Okay, because I would, I mean, I know we're up against the impacts on Thompson, but if we look at the historical data, that run is very much exceeding forecast numbers to a very high degree so uh i i would hope that you know there's there is a good opportunity for us to uh to bolster that quota even considering the 10 percent exploitation rate uh lastly mark and everyone else i'll let you guys go get back to every, anyone else who has questions but this draft was listed at as a march 17th draft which would have been the day after the co-manager meeting that you guys had last week so was this presented to the co-managers yet or was yep. it okay it has been Yep. And is there any sort of feedback that you're allowed to give to us at this point? Uh, I think it's fair to say the co-managers didn't provide much feedback when we uh, proposed it <laughs> and looked at it with the modeling. Okay. Uh, you know, I think we're we're still over on a number of objectives, uh, uh, you know, from Coho and Chinook. So there's there's additional shaping that need to be done with fisheries, and I think there's a a recognition on both sides that we still have some work to do. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Our next hand is from Kyle. Kyle, go ahead. Cool, thank you. Um, just a, a few questions, but I, I just want to start with the um, blackmouth fishery in Area 10, the Feb first opener, um, and just kind of concerned with what happened this year. I know, you know, aligning with with uh, marine area 11 should spread impact out. And I, I think I, I, a lot of folks like that. Um, but I'm wondering if, if it should start with the three day opener approach or something that allows um, data to be collected on uh, sublegal impacts and sort of the, um, you know, the trajectory, because it seemed like we got that data uh, you know, kind of as we were running out of quota this year, and um, it went for a pretty short time uh, compared to what I think we would we want it to go. I'm looking for any comments on that. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. That's something we have talked about. You know, if we have it scheduled for that time period of February through March, it kind of gives us an opportunity to kind of assess things early in the season. We do do test fishing in that area kind of, you know, throughout the the year um, as we can. So we, you know, we should have a pretty good idea of what that uh, those numbers look like leading into the season. Um, and we always have the, the opportunity to kind of change things before the season. Um, you know, this year we kind of, everything was kind of tracking as it did last year, which is why we kind of kept it open. And then it, it, things did not change as we anticipated that they would, uh, which is why we ended up having to close it down. But we, you know, kind of Again, these are all learning things as we're going forward with these kind of shorter openers that we're doing. You know, we can kind of assess that again this year and see what that looks like moving into the season. So we do have the opportunity, yes, to like have start with short week openers and then open it up um, kind of more for more days as the season goes on, as uh, those if, if those impacts stay within the limits. Uh, so I think that's definitely, definitely something we've talked about and already kind of considered going into next season. Um, so it's definitely on the table. Okay, awesome. Yeah, no, I think um, just hearing that, you know, there's some adjustments to that uh, approach um, compared to this year is, is super uh, encouraging that sort of doesn't show up in the proposed season. Um, but that's, uh, that's good to hear. And then I'm just wondering on the, um, the quill scene, same as topic and, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm curious about if there's any update, you know, one of the gentlemen on the call said they had potentially a Skokomish update um and i'm just kind of curious if, if anyone's um you know gone down the path of some kind of in, in 
of additional license stamp to, to pay for dedicated enforcement for some of these rivers. I, you know, I used to fish the Skokomish back in the day and um, as a uh, more law abiding uh, <laughs> angler. And, and, you know, some of the things that went on there were, were pretty um, disgraceful. Um, and it's just a shame that, you know, uh, it was closed down and it's still closed uh, with, but, you know, even if there was a path to opening, there'd have to be something to deal with um, the enforcement side. And so to hear that that's going on in the quill scene, salmon, some of these, I mean, incredible river fishing opportunities that are just, you know, ruined. I think a lot of us, you know, um, you know, shake our heads at some of those situations and decline, go fish somewhere else. But, uh, you know, that's an incredible opportunity that could be there if it was a different situation. So I don't know if, if there's anything, um, you know, that could get fun, dedicated enforcement that would help those things um, run smoother. Um, come my other question. Well, I'll uh, I'll maybe just comment generally and broadly. So the the legislature was uh, pretty nice to our agency last year uh, during the the budget cycle, uh, during the supplemental session. Um, we got uh, some extra money for monitoring and enforcement. Um, the thing about adding enforcement to our agency is it's a a multi year process to uh, onboard uh, enforcement officers and and get them trained, the, the right training and, and all that stuff. It, I think it's about a three-year process to, to from start to finish. So um, we have, uh, the agency's made it a priority uh, within the past number of years, especially since Director Suswin got on board. Um, we have added uh, officer capacity and, and done some restructuring around the state to try to better address some of these enforcement issues. Um, I'm gonna jump away from that and maybe just comment broadly on the Skokomish topic. Um, basically, there's there's nothing really new to report uh, other than, you know, we've heard from the, uh, the interior, the Office of the Interior, uh, that, uh, you know, they basically rejected our uh, appeal of their decision. Um, I think it's pretty clear to us that we're we're likely not going to get much support for our uh, position on the issue um, uh, at the federal level. And I think right now, I would say that the issue is in the director's office. Um, he is, uh, you know, this is not just uh, a WDFW issue. This this involves the entire state family. Um, uh, if we're going to go down a different road, so I think. You know that's the best update with that subject is it's at the director's office level. Uh, we've been exchanging some letters and and trying to figure out a path forward. So, and the last thing, Kyle, maybe I'll just you know the the thing with the Samish and on the quill scene and in other places. Um, this is one that we've really struggled with. Uh, we know that there's uh, uh, places where there's easy access for people to harvest. We know that there's places where we have incredible hatchery surplus that uh, that's why we produce these fish is for harvest. Um, and um, we just have, uh, uh, you know, overcrowding, uh, ethics issues, uh, all sorts of things that we've been struggling with over a long period of time. And, and uh, you know, we're gonna keep trying different things just to see if we can land somewhere different. Um, I know uh, staff has kicked around a bunch of outside the box ideas around this subject, but um, we're we're going to keep trying to do better. Okay, thank you. Our next hand is from Gabe. Gabe, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Is the uh, department proposing a four fish bag south of AOC again this year? Uh, I would say yes at the moment. I'm not, and I would ask maybe Derek to help me with this. And I'm not sure that our, our daily limit affects much on the exploitation rate. In the current modeling, we are over on uh, our the, the shared objective for Skokomish stock. So we're going to have to pay attention to that one and, and think about it. But yeah, right now, the, the same daily limits on the table. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, I missed the first part of the meeting. Are the tribal proposed tribal fisheries for this year in the modeling yet? Or are we still working off last year's fisheries? So um, we did do a co-manager model run uh, at the end of last week. I'm not sure that we've published th those results yet. They should be up on the website soon if they're not. Um, but yes, we did do a, a co-manager model run. It was deemed uh, quote unquote official uh, at the end of our co-manager meeting last week. So um, we still have a little bit of work to do on a number of stocks. Uh, um, you know, the, the Chinook objective is still at Guamish. We still have some work to do. We knew our initial proposal was high um, and we went over that a little bit at the beginning, uh, just kind of that strategy that we talked about last week at the, the public meeting, Gabe. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, I think the, the general uh, word is, is we're pretty close in a lot of areas. I think we were surprised that, uh, you know, some of the moves the tribes made to help get down uh, on these management objectives, but we still have a, a little bit of work to do. Thanks. Are we, uh, how close are we to low abundance threshold in Esqually? I think, and Derek, I don't know if you want to jump on, I think in the most recent modeling, we were over the low abundance threshold. threshold. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. We're, we're actually uh, in all three modeling options. We're a little bit under that low abundance threshold, so that 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 did actually shake out as one of the um, the, the things that we were concerned about, Gabe. Okay. And what's the exploitation rate, or what exploitation rate do we work off of if we go below low abundance threshold? Uh, it's a little bit weird. Um, so it's not a static exploitation rate if you fall below that low abundance threshold. It's basically um, taking your modeling run and taking the southern U.S. impacts and cutting them in half. So it would be at a, about a, I believe it would be about a 20% southern U.S. exploitation rate. Um, however, from the modeling that I've done, it looks like it would be, much, uh, it, it looks like it would be um, in, in, an easier task to then get above that low abundance threshold again of 6,300 fish in escapement than it would be to meet that southern U.S. objective once you fall below the LAT. So um, the, the the way I see it, kind of in the modeling, the, the the goal will be to get back above that low abundance threshold and then still be managing at a forty seven percent total exploitation rate, if that makes sense. Perfect. Thank you. Our next hand is from Zachary. Go ahead. Hey guys. Um, so I really like you know I like a lot of the decisions that in this latest proposal. Um, first things if you, is there a chance that y'all could like publish on the website for this meeting materials just so that we could get the slides to be able to see those uh, on our screens and not just the photos I took on my phone? Uh, I think that'd be, I'd appreciate that. Um, and then uh, did this modeling include the proposal to raise the size limit to 24 inches uh, for the areas five, six, seven, and nine for Chinook that is? Better. Exactly. Um, just to clarify, it did not at this time. Okay. Um, I put in, uh, I would love to see that change put in, you know, personally, I, I mean, you guys are the biologists more than I am, but I get the sense that a lot of those fish that are in that 22 to 24 inch range are, you know, the black mouth of the previous winter. Um, a lot of those, you know, resident fish that don't necessarily get as big. And I would love to see the, those, you know, it looks like about 1.7 stilly impacts. I'd love to see that going towards uh, buffering some of those winter opportunities just a little bit because, you know, that's that by raising that size limit that gets us more confidently on the water in winter. Um, whereas in the summer, I think that, you know, we're already out there and not keeping the sort of the small, smaller, scrawnier fish, I think is a, a worthy sacrifice to sort of bolster that winter opportunity. Um, if that, you know, that's my, my own personal thing. It's not really a um, and then last, so I see the green is managed to a 15% pre-terminal Southern U.S. Ex exploitation rate. Um, and I'm wondering, is Elliott Bay managed as a pre-terminal fishery or a terminal fishery? Zachary, um, it's actually considered a terminal fishery, the 10A fishery. Okay, so it's 10A, is a, 10A is a terminal fishery. Um, then I guess this is more for the, the freshwater to be next week, but I'll just, I'm going to put a, put, a, put a plug out anyways for, I'd love to see that you know, we have those bubble fisheries in that eastern, eastern uh, Elliott Bay, and that's that's fun. Um, but I think, like we're going to say, that's been really tough fishing. And 
if there is some headroom. I know we're, it looked like we were under, fairly under that pre-terminal. Actually, like the presentation from last week, I said 12.9% for 15% limit. And I know that's a pre-terminal pre versus them now knowing that's models of terminal fishery. But I'd love to see that fishery expanded into the lower, the lower Duwamish there. You know, there's a really cool coho troll fishery, and especially with the pinks this year, that that's sort of that very lower stretch up to Boeing. Um, there's a really cool coho troll fishery, and there's a lot of uh, Chinook bycatch that happens in there, especially in that September period. And if there are impacts available, I'd love to see some, uh, you know, at least consideration of having a, a Chinook season there. I know I'd prefer having that sort of lower river fishery over that eastern, uh, that eastern LA Bay, or maybe, you know, alongside or something, something along that. Just want to put that in for uh, consideration. Thank you, Zachary. We, we heard you uh, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about that internally. Appreciate it. Thank you. And that was our last hand. So just a reminder for those, oh, there we go. Uh, if you are having a hard time finding your raise hand function, it depends on what Zoom you have. It may be raise hand button at the bottom of your screen or reactions tab with a smiley face. And our next hand is Alex. Alex, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, I would support the area seven, area seven summer size increase to 24 inches. I just want to make sure that's noted on the record. Uh, and a questions last year, what was the final package? What was the stilly mortalities on that, on that package? I wasn't it around 70. Can you confirm that Derek? Give me just a moment to look that up, Alex. You think no I problem. remember this one offhand. <laughs> That's okay. And while you're looking, can you also just answer the second part of this would be what at the beginning of the slide, I think you listed uh, what we were currently at on, on those mortalities. If you could remind me what that number is, where are we at right now? I believe we're currently right at 100 in the current modeling. That was kind of the goal. So we've seen that goal increase. I mean, I know we talked about this last week, but I that that goal increased this year. I think so, it increased a little bit. I'll let so I'll let Derek answer the specifics when he jumps back on. Or Mark, go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that. I was just um I was just making sure that I was getting the correct numbers from last year. Um, it was actually it was actually sixty three last year was the number of mortalities at the at the very end of the process for non treaty fisheries. Um, and so um, you have to think that kind of um. The way that an exploitation rate is calculated is it looks at that um, harvest that occurs in fisheries, the number of mortalities that occurs in fisheries uh, over top of the adult abundance. So it's it's one divided by the other is the calculation for that exploitation rate. This year, we do have a higher forecast for Stiligwamish than we did last year. So there's a that denominator is now a greater number in that denominator. And so to achieve kind of uh, a numerator, uh, the number of mortalities uh, coming from fisheries that produces kind of the same exploitation rate, um, there would be a greater number of mortalities in that numerator. Okay, and I hope I'm not getting things confused here, but what is the number uh, for the stilly that we're looking at to be above the LAT, the LAT, the low abundance threshold? Um, we're, I, I believe that we're actually below the low abundance threshold right now. Um, yes. I believe that it's uh, 1500. So 1500 is the low abundance threshold. There's actually another tier below that. It's um, called the lower bound. And folks might remember from previous years that we were just forecast a little bit above the 900 mark and 900 is actually considered the, the, the lower bound. Okay. So, so last year we, we, we needed a package at that hit 63 stilly mortalities for us to get that approved by the co-managers. And you have uh, you have a, a hope, at, I guess, is a, is a right way to phrase it, that that number will be increased this year to get a package agreed upon? Thank well, you. It's really challenging at this stage because there's still kind of missing components to the modeling to know exactly what the final number of available stilly guamish mortalities will be at. I'm expecting that it's going to be somewhere between around 80 and 100 Stiligwamish mortalities um, will be what's available at the end. 
kind of the different pieces that go into affecting what could be available are that uh, once again we're still missing some of the Canadian fisheries from packages um, we um, we should hopefully get those before we go into the second Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting we're also missing some forecasts and there are kind of a few other little pieces that potentially uh, affect things uh, as well um, ocean fisheries, for example, right. wh whatever ocean option we determine, although the ocean usually has a, a, a relatively small impact on Stiligwamish from the non-treaty side. Um, so kind of um, um, what, 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 what I guess I'm saying there is right now I'm looking at that range um, going into this first modeling exercise where we're putting in our first Puget Sound fisheries. Uh, we were actually trying to be kind of on the optimistic end of that. And that's mm -hmm. why we were targeting about 100 mortalities. Um, and uh, it's very likely that in subsequent modeling exercises, as uh, things start to get narrowed in on, as we start getting those Canadian fisheries in the model, as we figure out the ocean options, as we figure, as we get all our forecasts in, um, that number is going to change. Um, and it's very likely that that number will be somewhere lower than uh, 100 mortalities. But um, um, it's, it's at least in my opinion, it's a good place to be at to start a little high and whittle it down uh, right. rather than uh, come in uh, pretty conservative and find out that there's actually uh, more on the uh, table, more mortalities yeah. potentially available. Right. I wouldn't say that or I would ask almost that not very often do we see that number increase after we see Canadian numbers come in. Would that be correct? Um, well, last year, we, last year we didn't, but I think there have been times historically, um, and I'd have to go double check this because I'm not 100% sure on it, but I, I, it can go up or down. So um, I, I think there's probably been times in the past where we have seen that. But once again, last year we did not, and this year it's really hard to anticipate what we could see. Yeah, I would just make it known just so we have a realistic expectation here that there's quite a big difference between 80 mortalities and 100. That that's that can be a significant change to our season package. So uh, I, I appreciate the optimism, but just to note that the realities are with 20 mortalities that can change packages quite significantly. So thanks a lot so, so much for tonight and the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. And I, I do agree with that sentiment for what it's worth. Our next hand is from Zachary again. Zachary, go ahead. Hey, I'll keep this quick. Sorry. Um, one thing that I uh, really slipped my mind. Does the proposal currently have uh, Chum open in Area 10 and 11 in October? It does not. Um, Chum is, as we all know, is a commercial priority. And so, and Chum fisheries are open by in-season management. That happens, you know, kind of as the season goes along. If there are is recreational opportunity available, we will determine that by in-season updates um, as it's going on. And I see Mark has unmuted, so I'll let him add to what I just said. So it's really less about the, the North of Falcon prioritization within the policy and more about We've had some really, really poor productivity years uh, in Chum. Um, we've closed uh, Mid Sound through South Sound um, and really just opened those opportunities really limitedly. The forecasts for this year really are not great. Um, and especially for the Nisqually winter Chum stock, which comes later, um, it's really not great. Um, I think like 5,000 or so is the forecast and the escapement goal is like 25,000. So um, there's a lot of concern around Chum in recent past. The co-managers have been working really hard to, to, to try to make sure we're doing right by the kind of the, the most robust natural population we got left um, south of the south of the Narrows. So um, I know that's not a satisfactory answer. I think we're going to try to, you know, depending on how those early test fisheries look, we could open up chum opportunity late in the October period um, in 10, but uh, that would really depend on what we're seeing in those early October test fisheries. Yeah, I appreciate that. I just, I'd love to, I'd love to see that, you know, potentially, potentially open up in whatever capacity it could, but I get the, you know, the concerns, you know, I know that that's not a fishery that a lot of people hold near and dear, but you know, whatever that opportunity could be, you know, I'd love to even see like a, um, I know the green has had some really robust uh, chum runs, uh, you know, I know there's some hatchery supplementation there, but I'd love to even see like, a, I know, I guess there's treaty conflicts potentially, but seeing a, a Elliott Bay opener for chum potentially even in an, with, with an area 10 spectrum, just sort of to get, you know, any opportunity that, that, that there uh, could be, but, you know, I get those, those conservation concerns and I'm not going to, not going to hang my hat on, on chum. 
Well, uh, I will tell you, you're not the only one to advocate for it. We we actually got an email today. So uh, it's definitely a, a popular fishery with folks. So thanks I, for- I appreciate it. It's fun, fun to get those fisheries where you can be casting for them and not just stuck, you know, trolling the flashers. Yep. Thanks for that. And that was our last hand for right now. Um, looks like we did have a question in the chat from M. Faulkner. You can ask your question live if you'd like. Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So I saw a slide that talked about about 5,000 uh, quota for Chinook in the Puget Sound, and it wasn't clear to me if that was encounters or if that was actual quota. Um, sorry, um, maybe, do you know um, if it was referring to a specific area? Um, I was mostly focused on the uh, area 10. Ah, uh, yes, um, yep, so that, that that is correct. That it was, um, let me go just double check the slide here real fast, but I believe it was about um, 5,200 is the quota. That's the catch, not the encounters for area 10. It would be okay. quite a large quota compared to what we've had in recent years. Okay, good. I uh, had some other questions if I can go ahead and ask those. Go for it. So this last season area 10 winter fishery um, was I think a disaster. Um, and I think in part it's due to closing six and nine that we used to have open starting in November. Um, so we put everybody into one space and uh, I don't think we managed it very well in terms of looking at the number of shakers that are in that in that area. So why can't we have a flexible, and I, maybe someone else brought this up, why can't we have a flexible opener um, or season so that if we find that the shakers are all there, um, we hold off a little bit? Yeah, I think that's something that we were looking into for this year is kind of having a, a slower opener for when we open when we do open up those fisheries in um, February this next year in 10 and 11 is maybe starting out slower and kind of um, seeing how the first couple of weekends go before deciding to open up more. That's definitely a possibility uh, to, you know, kind of start slower. We have that ability to do that in season um, based on what the test fishing looks like early on in, the, in, you know, kind of January leading up to that opener next year. So it's definitely something we're considering. Okay. And maybe this isn't the meeting to ask this kind of a question, but I was curious as to why we never get our own permit from NOAA and we're always piggybacking off the tribe you know who who would you ask that question to who's responsible for that decision well i'll i'll try to take that one that's uh ultimately it's the director's decision but i mean um so part of it, it gets really complicated really fast uh noah's still going to have to evaluate uh, both sets of fisheries um, when it comes to uh, whether we get our own permit or not. Hopefully by this time next year, we're past that because we'll have long-term ESA coverage under the management plan that we submitted next year. So, uh, you know, we've been managing to, uh, under that plan for really the past two years um, and, and plan to continue doing that into the future. Um, we, I don't know if folks are aware, we did get a letter of sufficiency this year from NOAA Fisheries saying that the, the co-manager plan for Chinook uh, is sufficient enough that allows them to do their work uh, through the biological opinion uh, and the, the uh, NEPA process uh, that they have to go through uh, as part of that evaluation under the Endangered Species Act. So, um, I think part of the complication was also back uh, in 2016 when we tried to uh, go for our plan. Um, you know, there wasn't an identified avenue for us to to submit our own plan back then. Um, we've had a number of discussions with the the, the federal partners uh, uh, since then, but I still don't think that we necessarily have a clearly identified pathway. For, uh, for getting our own permit. The other thing I'll say about that is, you know, just going all the way back to the USV uh, uh, Washington court case uh, around co-management, it says that we have to agree. And so regardless of whether we have our own plan or not, 
at the end of the day, we still have to do co-management and agree and make decisions together. Sure, I agree with all that, but it seems like it opens it up to brinksmanship um, if you if you are not on equal footing. Um, but but it sounds like it sounds like we are moving um, away from that. It's is that correct? Uh, we're we're trying, and I okay. wouldn't necessarily say it's equal footing, but um, you know uh, it's it's uh, co-management, it's cooperative management. Right, that's the co in part in the equality. Okay, that's all I had. Thanks. And that was our last question for now. Um, just a reminder, raise your hand at the reaction tab or the raise hand button on your screen. And it doesn't look like we have anybody on the phone. Kirsten, I don't know if you want to go back a couple of slides. Um, maybe just again, go over the, the next couple of weeks as we, uh, all the meetings and engagements are foremost on staff's minds now. So tomorrow evening, we're going to have a Willapaw Bay discussion on Zoom. Tomorrow during the days, uh, Columbia River, uh, North of Falcon meeting, it was scheduled for last week but had to be rescheduled, it's uh, tomorrow. Uh, on Wednesday will be the Grace Harbor meeting. Uh, again, we're gonna be back on Zoom. This crew here will be back on Zoom Thursday night uh, to have basically a redo of this presentation, but also talk about other freshwater fisheries uh, uh, within Puget Sound, uh, North End fisheries, and then you know Nisqually, Puyallup Green, those fisheries um, in a little more detail. And then next slide, Kirsten. And then again, uh, next Wednesday, March 29th, uh, we will be at the lovely Linwood Embassy Suites for a meeting starting at 9 a.m. Uh, it'll also be the hybrid meeting like we've been doing with North of Falcon kickoff meeting and the North of Falcon one meeting last week. Uh, that same day, there's gonna be an in-person Upper Columbia Snake River Northeast McNary meeting in Kennewick. Uh, also on the 30th, uh, before folks head to California, we'll have a joint Willapaw Grace Harbor Fisheries discussion. Uh, and then as Kirsten said earlier, uh, down in California for that first week of uh, April. And uh, we will have daily updates starting on Monday about where those fisheries decisions are going. Uh, we do know some of our Puget Sound advisors have already planned on being down there. So they'll be with us in the room uh, down there in California as well. Now that I've talked again for a little bit, uh, any other questions or comments tonight? I do want to remind folks, uh, please spread the word as well. Uh, we're trying to keep the website up to date as much as we can. Tons of information there, uh, modeling, um, different, different, uh, um, meeting documents from each of our meetings this spring, uh, forecast documents, those kind of things. We really do pay attention to people's comments. Uh, we look at all those things uh, as we're making decisions through the process. So just really appreciate everybody's time and, and being here tonight and providing us your thoughts. Uh, and with that, uh, I think we can say good night. Thanks for being here, everybody.